since uh, the country's economy opened up to the rest of the world, a move that ultimately turned China into a global economic powerhouse, second in GDP only to the United States. China is engaged in a whole-of-state effort to become the world's only superpower by any means necessary. The People's Liberation Army has been building up its capabilities. Astonishing economic growth over the decades has provided resources needed to boost military research and development. China's Belt and Road Initiative is the most expensive infrastructure project in history. The initiative is also building China's influence. I think China is playing the long game here, but they want to be the number one economic power in the world. Hi everybody, we all know China as one of the most powerful countries in the world. And it is so, so hard to believe that a country that is known today as the second largest economy in the world with a $17 trillion GDP, just 45 years back, the same country was crippling with a 60% poverty rate. While on one side today we see China as a futuristic solar and electric superpower, the same country in the 1970s was so backward that the Chinese knew nothing but farming and that too during the time of industrialization. And lastly, while on one side we see this glamorous skyline of Shanghai, it is so hard to visualize that once upon a time this country had such a bad economy that millions of people died due to starvation. So the question is, what exactly happened from 1978 to 2018 that China went from being an impoverished country to becoming a global superpower? What exactly were their business and political strategies that made them so so powerful? And most importantly, what are the lessons that India needs to learn from the rise of China? This video is brought to you by Kuku FM, but more on this at the end of the video. This is a story that dates back to late 1970s. This is when Mao Zedong was leading China. And the condition of the country under Mao got so bad that while the Nazis killed about 15 million people, 20 million people were killed under the Stalin regime. But the number of people who died under Mao Zedong alone is estimated to be between 50 to 80 million people. And a majority of them died due to starvation. This was majorly because of the adverse communistic principles adopted by Mao Zedong and his people. And needless to say, all these policies failed and China was crippling with a poverty rate of 60%. So the question is, how did this country go on to become a superpower and that too in just 40 years? Well, the answer to this lies with the policies of this man named Deng Xiaoping, who took charge after Mao Zedong passed away in 1976. After visiting multiple countries to understand their economies, Deng Xiaoping came out with some incredible policies that changed the face of China. And one of the most revolutionizing policies of all was something called the Open Door Policy. And under this policy, they set up something called the Special Economic Zone. And this growth model is also something that India is trying to pursue. So let's try to understand how does the Special Economic Zone function. Let's say Apple is a company that has been operating in the US where it took care of everything. So ideation, designing, manufacturing and distribution, all of it was done in the US itself. But by the 1970s and 80s, when the cost of labor in the US started increasing, these type of companies started outsourcing their labor intensive processes, as in manufacturing and assembly started to be outsourced to the emerging markets. This was because the labor cost in these emerging markets was extremely cheap. Why? Because in these countries, most of the people lived in poverty. So any bit of income for them was a lot of income. So this way, the American companies got cheap labor and the people of that country got a source of income. But you know what guys, the biggest challenge for a company like Apple was not labor, but other major expenses like buying land, building factory, importing the machinery and importing raw materials. And back then in a non-liberalized country like India, these kind of foreign investments were either not allowed or import duties were as high as 100%. But in a special economic zone, the government of a particular country gives special privileges to eliminate all these four cost barriers like import duty, land, construction and raw material import. In this case, a country like China would tell Apple that we will charge you only 1% import duty on your machines, give you the land for a 99 year lease and that too at one tenth the cost and thirdly, we will charge you a bare minimum of just 1% import duty on raw materials. All you have to do is build the factory, invest a minimum of 10 million dollars or more and start operating. 
In some cases, the government might even waive off the taxes on profits for three years if the company needs time to break even. And even after that, if the taxes in mainline is 33%, in a special economic zone, it would be only 15%. This is the reason why hundreds of companies from all around the world started flocking to China to set up their manufacturing hub. Now the question over here is, companies like Apple benefit from this, that's fine. But if China gives out such a huge tax exemption to huge companies like Apple, how does China make money? Well, the way China benefits from this is that when Apple recruits 20,000 workers to work at the plant, these workers and their families will be lifted out of poverty. So if each worker gets paid $5 per day, every month, $3 million worth of income is coming to the people of China. And what will these workers do with all this money? They would go on to buy food, grocery and medicines. So this way, money starts flowing into the economy and the government doesn't have to spend on welfare and subsidies to actually support these people. On top of that, because these people and their families have been lifted out of poverty, they would send their child to a better school who would then go on to make 10 times more money after she graduates. So you see, an entire generation is being lifted out of poverty. And after 10 years, when the sons and daughters of these workers make money, they would go on to become permanent and premium taxpayers to the economy of China. Secondly, after these companies have made hundreds of millions of dollars worth of investments, none of them will leave China for the next 30 years at least. And the best part was that the labor cost in China was so low that even after 22 years of liberalization, the cost of labor in China was 53 times lower than the US. So you can imagine how amazing China was for the US companies. This is the reason why you will see that the biggest companies in the world, including Apple, Tesla, Samsung and hundreds of other companies, have their manufacturing hub in China. In fact, today, China is known to be the world's factory, with more than 20% of the entire world's manufacturing happening in China itself. Now, the moment I say cheap labor and China, most people would say, yeah bro, so what? Anybody can give out cheap labor and become developed, right? Because that's what Bangladesh, Vietnam, Indonesia are doing. But you know what guys? The Chinese did not stop there. Other than becoming the world's factory with cheap labor, the Chinese government has an extremely futuristic approach for their global dominance. And it's absolutely mind-boggling to see how far they can actually think. Two classic examples of the same are the solar and EV industries. You see this chart? Back in the 1990s, the US was the pioneer in solar with more than 40% share of the global PV cell market. But then something crazy happens later on. US went down to less than 10% share and China and Taiwan crossed more than 50% of the global market share by 2010. Now, if you look at the process of making solar panels, you will see that first we have polysilicon, which is melted and shaped into ingots. Then ingots are sliced into wafers. Wafers are doped into cells. And finally, the cells are assembled into finished solar panels. And guess what? As of 2021, China produced more than 80% of the entire world's polysilicon and roughly 98% of the wafers and ingots. The question is, out of all the countries that stand today, how did China become a monopoly? The answer to this lies in this chart. Now, if you look at the cost of producing solar energy, Back in the early 2000s, it was at $750 per megawatt hour. Whereas the cost of producing energy from coal was at $120 to $150. So even though several solar manufacturing companies popped up in the US, they couldn't make profits and eventually they had to be shut down because no one could afford to buy solar panels at that cost. But the catch over here is that in 2003-04, when solar companies started emerging in China, even they started incurring losses. But they survived in spite of all these losses for the next 15 years. You know why? Because the government of China recognized the importance of solar companies 20 years down the line. So the government itself gave out free land, free electricity, free capital and at times even free laborers who were paid by the state itself. So the government kept these loss making companies alive with its own money gave them special rebates for research and development and kept on funding the innovation for solar energy just to make sure that the solar companies are alive when the time is right. And what happened next took the entire world by surprise. In the next 20 years by 2019, while the cost of energy from coal still costs $109, the cost of solar has decreased by 89%, going from $359 to just $40 per megawatt hour and now it's just $11 per megawatt hour. So for the first time in human history, 
renewable sources look way cheaper than fossil fuels now i don't know if you realize this or not but then this is as big as oil and today while everybody is rushing to make solar panels the country that controls the supply chain of solar is the superpower of the industry and who's that now china why because they bet on solar energy 15 freaking years back and not just that somehow the think tank of china also realized that electric vehicles are going to be the future and they somehow became a dominating force in the ev market also to tell you about it this story dates way back to 2007 and 8 and this is when the world was witnessing one of the worst economic crises in its history let's talk about the speed with which we are watching this market deteriorate we're down over 16% dow at the same time has fallen about 18% it was the worst day on wall street since the crash of 1987 what started in america last year has now spread to every part of the world like this could be the most serious recession in decades and that means life as most americans know it is about to change in some cases dramatically and while the entire world was trying to recover china was busy entering a country called the republic of congo this country was ravaged with wars its economy was crippling and barely any countries were interested in investing in the republic of congo but suddenly china became extremely friendly with this nation and provided a 5 billion dollar loan for developing the infrastructure in congo now the question is why would anyone invest in a country like congo and that too during a recession well as it turns out the republic of congo has the largest cobalt mine in the world and why is cobalt important because it's one of the most crucial metals used for making ev batteries and guess what Congo has 3.5 million tons of cobalt reserves as of 2021 and these mines are so valuable that they account for 51% of the entire world's cobalt reserves but back in 2007-8 nobody bothered to buy cobalt but this is when the chinese seized the opportunity and signed an infrastructure for mineral deal with congo which meant that china will give congo money and loan and in return congo will give china the rights to extract metals and minerals from congo They set up a joint venture way back in 2007-8 that was named Sino Congolese Des Mines and in this venture the Chinese have a majority shareholding of 68%. So basically all the cobalt that comes out of Congo China gets a majority share of the profits. And what blew my mind is that almost 70% of the Congolese mining portfolio is under the Chinese control. This is what China started doing 15 years back. way before the world took evs seriously and now fast forward to 15 years later when every single country is racing to buy cobalt when cobalt prices have shot up by 400% guess who is selling cobalt to the world and now the demand of cobalt is expected to grow by another 400% in the next 8 years and china is just waiting to show its dominance to the world This is how China's extremely futuristic vision and an aggressive investment strategy have enabled it to become a superpower not just in terms of manufacturing but also with the most valuable resources in the world. And lastly, it's the geopolitical strategy of China that is making it super powerful. A prime example of the same is the Belt and Road Initiative that we have covered in our previous series. This project started way back in 2013 by the way and is expected to be completed by 2035. You see, that is an insanely well thought project for 22 long years. We've already made a five part series on it, so if you haven't watched it yet, I'll give you a link in the description. This is how China went from being an impoverished country to becoming the second largest economy of the world and one of the most powerful countries of the 21st century and this brings me to the most important part of the episode and that are the lessons that india and every other country needs to learn from the rise of china before we move on i want to thank our partners kuku fm for supporting our content people if you are someone who wants to learn more about business and geopolitics in your own regional language you must listen to the fantastic audio books on kuku fm app Kuku FM is India's largest vernacular audio learning platform with over 1000 plus hours of content in their library with 4.5 star rating and a ton of insightful audiobooks in multiple regional languages. In this case, if you are fascinated by the rise of China, you could listen to this audiobook called The Rise of China or this audiobook called China and India: Asia's Emergent Great Powers. So if these kind of subjects intrigue you then use the code think50 to get a 50% discount on the Kuku FM subscription. This is applicable only for the first 1000 people so go ahead use the link in the description and download the Kuku FM app now.
Moving on to the lessons, the first thing we need to learn is that population is a double-edged sword. If utilized properly, it will go on to make you a superpower. And at the same time, if you don't leverage it, it will become your biggest liability and will crumble your economy. In case of China, they turned it into an asset and became a superpower in just four decades. So as citizens of India, keep an eye on the government policies and see what the government is doing to use this humongous population to our advantage. Lesson number two, the world is moving towards a new era of industrial revolution and this era will kill the demand of old resources and bring in massive demand for new resources. So the question is, what are we doing today to capitalize on the resources that will become valuable 20 years later? The US did this with technology, China did this with solar and cobalt industry. So the question is, what is India doing to bet on the future? And lastly, in the world of geopolitics, leverage is the most important factor that defines power. In this case, the Chinese first leveraged their labor, then they went on to dominate cobalt and solar industry, and now they are using their Belt and Road Initiative to strengthen their geopolitical position 20 years down the line. Now, although the ethics of it are quite debatable, it has undeniably created a factor of leverage that the world is bowing down to. So the question that we got to ask ourselves now and 20 years down the line is, what is the leverage that India has over the world? That's all from my side for today, guys. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to hit the like button in order to make YouTube Baba happy. Please find your study materials in the description. And for more such insightful business and political case studies, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.